President of the Socialist and Democrat Group in the European Parliament, members of the European Parliament, permanent representatives and ambassadors, members of the Euro European and e an Economic and Social Committee and of the European Committee of the Regions, Directors General and Directors of the European Institutions, Bodies and Services, Vice President and General Secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation, representatives of trade unions and employers' organizations and other authorities, ladies and gentlemen. As General Director of New Economy International Forum, I am pleased to welcome you to this Forum Europa event, which is organized thanks to the essential contribution of five companies that demonstrate their strong commitment to Europe and its citizens every day. These are Airbus, AAG, Indra, Solaria, and Telefonica. As many of you know, Forum Europa started its activities in Brussels, the capital of the European Union, at the beginning of this year under the motto, Ideas to Strengthen the Union, and coinciding with the final stretch of a crucial legislature and the elections to the European Parliament. So far, we have had the honor of hosting the interventions of Ms. Roberta Metzola, President of the European Parliament, Mr. Josep Borrell Fontelles, EU High Representative for uh, um, Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, Ms. Annalise Feuerlinden, Belgian Minister of the Interior, Institutional Reform and Democratic Renewal, Ms. Margarete Festager, European Commissioner and Executive Vice President for the Eurofit for the Digital Age and Commissioner for Competition, Mr. Margarete Skinas, Vice President of the European Commission for Promoting Our European Way of Life, Ms. Nadia Calvino, President of the European Investment Bank, and Mr. Paul Magnet, President of the Socialist Party in Belgium, and Mayor of Charleroi. Today, we have the great opportunity to continue exchanging ideas to strengthen the Union, this time with Ms. Stel Lynch, General Secretary of the European Trade Union Confederation, who will be introduced by Ms. Elache Garcia Perez, President of the Socialist and Democrats Group in the European Parliament. Thank you very much, Ms. Lynch, Ms. Garcia. As you can imagine, these are busy days for the European Parliament, so Ms. Garcia will need to leave shortly after her introduction. She has to attend the meeting of the Conference of the Presidents of the European Parliament to prepare next week's important plenary session. So without further ado, Ms. Garcia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good morning. Good morning, dear friends. It's uh, such a pleasure to cooperate once again uh, with the Nueva Economia Forum and uh, now Forum uh, uh, Europa Division. And of course, it's a great pleasure to be accompanied by our colleague and friend, Esther Lins. Dear Esther, let me confess that uh, I feel very proud to have fought alongside you for a fair Europe. I want to thank you for your courage, your commitment, and your loyalty. Because after your election as a general secretary of the TUC in December 2022, we managed to put the social rights more firm on the European map. We managed to speak with one voice about the importance of building a social Europe that is full of opportunities for everybody. These last few days, I must also confess that I have been asking myself what we want when we talk about a social Europe. We want a Europe where citizens have equal opportunities. We want quality jobs that offer decent salaries and work-life balance. We want gender equality, and gender equality means the same rights the same opportunities and the same wages for men and women. We want workplaces that are safe and that protect the physical and mental health of the workers. We want to protect those who are often excluded, like people suffering homelessness, of young people unemployment. Really, dear friends, we know that building so, uh, the pillar of social right, it's a huge team effort. We know that we are going through a crucial moment in the history of the European Union. 
after the pandemic, I think we have all learned clear lessons. We are stronger together. And working together as a progressives, we are able to successfully face today's challenges. Friends, our decisive contribution to building a fairer Europe cannot just be part of our past. The legacy of your work compels us to continue building a Europe of greater social justice in this time of great difficulty. There are still too many citizens living in poverty, in unemployment, without decent wages and without affordable housing. We must offer citizens a European project that inspire them once again. As you know, we are in the middle of intense negotiations to decide who must be the leader of the European Commission. And our message to the president designated of the Commission is clear. The support of social democrats is incompatible with any opening up to the far right. We will be a firewall against the far right through the European Union. We will be the essential force for defending our social model, a social model that is unique in the world. We will show that it's possible to have a union that innovates, combats, and grows without cutting back on workers' rights and without sacrificing our welfare state. A union with a strong social pillar inspired by La Ulf declaration that guarantees new labor rights with quality internships, the right to training, the right to disconnect, and the conditions for remote work and an artificial intelligence in the workplace. A union that remains faithful to our social model and guarantee decent jobs, rising wages, minimum living incomes, and anti-poverty strategy that will leave 50 million people <coughs> out of poverty. No force can stop our eternal aspiration to achieve a union of equality between men and women. Dear Esther, you became the second woman to hold the post of Secretary General of the TUC. Let's continue to demonstrate that women's aspirations have not limits. Let's put an end to the injustice that women suffer through the European Charter of Women's Rights, the revision of wage transparency to include all companies regardless of their size, and the inclusion of the gender-based violence in the list of the European Union crimes. Dear Esther, our journey together has not finished. You have been a brave trade unionist since you first joined a union in a factory making microchips in the 80s. You are a strong leader and a person committed to the highest European values. Let's fight with all our courage, all our commitment, and all our loyalty to make social rights felt in every home, in every workplace in the European Union. The future must be and will be social. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Garcia, for your introduction. Now, I would like to welcome on stage Ms. Ster Lynch, who will deliver a speech before a question and answer session. Yeah. 
Well, this is a great way to begin a Thursday. Thanks, everybody, uh, for being here. And thank you, Iraxa, for that really powerful introduction and for, for paying me the huge honor of introducing me. You're right, we're working really well uh, together, both as people, but also as, as organizations. Thank you for everything that you're doing today. I know that you need to leave, and I, it's important that you do do that. Thank you for standing up for working people, their families and communities. And also a huge thanks to Forum Europe for inviting the ETUC to be here today and to have an opportunity to say how we can strengthen the union. Now, this was immediately a problem for me because whenever I say the union, I mean the trade union. Whereas many people in the room, when you say the union, you mean the European Union. So if I, I'm going to rely on everybody here knowing the meaning when I say union, whether it's going to be European Union or whether it's going to be the trade union. If anybody has questions, we can take it up at the end which one I meant. So um, I, I think it's, we all, I also have a fairly simple nutshell answer. If it's anybody's to say to you, what did Esther say was the main way to strengthen the European Union? She said quality jobs. And that's what the speech is going to be about. It's going to be about a roadmap for how we get to quality jobs. What are the challenges we face? But importantly, the solutions, because nobody wants to listen over breakfast to a long list of complaints. What you want to hear is solutions and the way forward. But I do think for the working people, that we represent, it's important that I do flag some of the problems that they have. Because this dissatisfaction that workers are feeling with the European Union largely comes from the dissatisfaction and problems that they have in the world of work. There's a genuine feeling, not just among workers, but in among large parts of society, that for a lot of people, things are not going the right way. Things aren't fair, working people aren't getting a fair reward even though they put in a hard day's work. They're being asked to do more and more, faster and faster, less, less reward. Contracts, and in particular the psychological contract, has got a lot thinner and more fragile. There's a lot less trust and instead there's more supervision, more surveillance, more punishment. Fear has all too often become the go-to tool of management. And I don't know what the management schools have been teaching, but I see more and more that being uh, the way in which people are managed. And then on top of that, we see insecurity, price increases, uh, housing becoming unaffordable. And how I would describe it is a feeling that my, my working life is so much better than my parents'. My son and his friends, their life, their working life, has more in common with my parents than with me. And they can't really see the way in which they get to the working life that I have. A secure pension, prospects, a career, I know what's going to happen. Young people struggling with not having that. Now before I go any further, I also want to say that that contrasts sharply with a lot of great employers who provide great jobs with a future, who invest in the workers, who invest in the workforce, who make sure that people, if they have problems, that there's solutions there for them. And in instead of being encouraged and supported, what we see is that they're being undercut and challenged. And so what we have is a formula that supports not only the workers who are struggling, but also those companies who want to do the right thing, of which they are the majority. So that's why our first, our first uh, recommendation to Ursula von der Leyen that you can bring, Araxa, is that it's not, it's not a time for backward-looking reforms. They can't fall into a trap of a backward-looking uh, approach based on deregulation and less rights. Can't, can't fall into putting trade unions or any of the institutions of social dialogue into question. Competition isn't only about the cost to the company of doing business. It's also about the framework in which companies operate. We should be proud of our standards. There's companies here who are leading the way on the green transition. We should encourage, respect, and valorize them. 
we shouldn't look towards rowing back on any of the standards. Instead, we should invest in the companies, invest in the workers to make that just transition. The common set of standards provides guarantees not only of environmental and health and safety, it's also a way in which we can be proud of the products we produce. People like to buy things made in Europe because they know there's a guarantee. There was no misery in the production. There was health and safety rights of the workers and the product itself is one that you can rely on. We should talk that up, not challenge its existence. Instead, as I've said, it's time to mobilize a project of hope to deliver quality jobs where all working people have a good living, a fair day's pay for a fair day's work, enough time to, to, to spend with their family, the ability to bargain through a trade union so that you have a fair share of the profits, but also that you can retire in dignity. Quality jobs, every sector, every region. Quality jobs, all workers, no matter what job they do, no matter who they are, where they're from, or who they love. And Araxa, you are so right. That's why we worked so hard to get the Pay Transparency Directive, to put e equal pay on the map. Not just flat out discrimination, but also that indirect discrimination that has existed for so long, that allows people, companies, employers, or society to think that cleaning and caring is low skilled work, it's not. COVID proved that that was essential, life-saving essential work. And that's why we want to put the pay on the table of carers and cleaners to say that equal pay for work of equal value means you need to look at the value that that job is providing to the company in a more realistic way. It's gonna be challenging, but it's gonna be exciting too. It's gonna to be the next wave uh, of uh, the equal pay uh, uh, story for all of us. We're also looking for concrete backing for legislative demands. And I very much hope in the program, workers will be able to see a clear list. Um, and I'm gonna speak very quickly about what they are. I know that we'll probably have time in questions, but first and foremost, we need a European industrial plan for quality jobs that ensures the green and digital transitions and a just transition become a reality. Now, working people have been told that they won't be left behind, but they look at what the reality is, and the sad fact is a lot of workers are being left behind. Our research shows that the number of people employed in manufacturing has fallen by 853,000 between 2019 and 2023. For sure, some of that had to do with COVID and all of the problems associated with the wars in the region, but it's also about the problem of deindustrialization because we are decarbonizing. What we see as the solution is investment for companies so that companies can make the, tr the transition, so that the companies can succeed, but the investment can't come as a blank check. The investment needs to have social conditionalities, meaning that the workers will succeed attached to them. We also need to make sure that member states have the money to invest, that companies have the money to invest. That's why we need a permanent mechanism at European level. We need a directive to give the guarantees to the workers that they'll be involved in negotiating and managing the change through their trade unions. And that needs to be backed up with guarantees. A guarantee that redundancy won't be the first option a guarantee of access to training, a guarantee of supports to find another job. For this reason, we're looking for a just transition directive to accomplish this. We also need to revise the EU public procurement directives. It's unacceptable that public money goes to companies that undercut that try to compete on the basis of cutthroat wages and bad terms and conditions. Instead, what we need to do is to make sure that our public money works for us to achieve the social objectives. And what I'm talking about is a collective agreement with fair pay and conditions. That's what I'm talking about when I'm saying that we need public procurement rules um, to protect 
uh, a collective agreement and the ability to fight for fair pay. It's about respect, respect for the worker and the work that they do. We also need to regulate the role of labour intermediaries and to introduce an, an, a, 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 a limit on the amount of subcontracting that can happen. But also, we can't have a situation where more and more workers don't even know who their employer is because of the long subcontracting chain. They think the person they're meeting is their employer, but it turns out there's two or three people in between that. That's an abuse, it's a loophole. We have to close it because it's a threat to the strength of our union based on the threshold of decency of standards that we've all agreed on. The challenge of artificial intelligence also is looming large and is on everybody's minds. We need to speak to that, not be afraid of it. We need to welcome science. We need to encourage and, in, and innovate. But we also can't do that naively. We need to make sure that we have a moral imagination of what might go wrong and put in place the laws to prevent that. It will be a catastrophe if we're trying to fix things after the artificial intelligence has been introduced in an unfair way. Let's stop it happening in the first place. And then finally on the list for directives that we would very much like to see mentioned is psychosocial risks. And I just want to talk very briefly about this idea of ethical stress. So I meet more and more workers who talk to about burnout and stress. And, and when, you, when, you, when you dig a bit behind it, what they describe as circumstances of going to work and not doing the job that they want and believe and their vocation, their career, their occupation, they know needs from them. I'll give you an example. Let's think of a nurse. Let's think of a teacher. A nurse knows a patient is struggling and wants to spend the time with them and can't because of the number of patients that they have to see. They do that day in, day out. They go home upset that they weren't able to do the job. And they get up in the morning knowing they're going to have the same difficult day of not being able to give the care that they were trained to give. Same for a teacher, a struggling student. You know you need to spend the time with that student, but you don't have that time because there's so many other children in the classroom. That's what we're calling ethical stress. And it's in lots of occupations. Workers want to do a good day at work, and it's stressful for them when they can't because they're not provided with the time, the equipment, the support uh, to be able to do that. And the solution for that isn't more monitoring and surveillance and fear. The solution to that is investment, cooperation, discussion, support, pay. It's about breaks. It's about, you know, making sure that people can, can do uh, the job. And that's why we very much hope that the idea of the psychosocial risk directive that allows us the opportunity to discuss how we deal with the growing insecurity. And I think a lot of the labor shortages are intimately linked with this question of ethical stress. Then finally, um, we need to build on the Val du Chess Pact. The recent La Hoop Declaration importantly reaffirmed the indispensable nature of effective social dialogue at European level. It's a fundamental concept of our European social model and of our European democracy. Because European democracy isn't only about elections every four years, every five years. Uh, European democracy also comes from being part of your trade union. It's how you practice your democracy in your everyday life, in your working life. Trade unions bargain not only for fair wages and working conditions, but also for lots of other stuff that's relevant in the world of work. And we provide an important check and balance on power in the workplace. And that's why we must put strengthening trade unions and collective bargaining front and, front and center in the discussion on strengthening the European Union and a European Union based on quality jobs. All too often, collective bargaining is entirely absent. And increasingly, we're seeing American-style union-busting practices making their way into Europe. That should be outlawed. Collective action shouldn't be outlawed. Union busting should be outlawed. We very much are looking for member states 
um, to put in place the collective bargaining coverage so that we can reach 80%. And I look here around and I see leaders in that field from the business community. I see business leaders here who know the value of social dialogue, who know the value of collective bargaining, who know the value of trade unions, and who have the skills to make that work. I go to other rooms and I meet employers who don't have that, who see that the way in which they, they want to deal with trade unions is to keep them out of the workplace. The way they want to deal with social dialogue is to make it into lobbying, not dialogue based on problem solving. And all too often, I think that all, all issues are approached in a manner which is to say who's right and who's wrong, rather than what are the different interests at, at stake and how do we um, address those um, in, a, in a positive manner. So I think that all the supports that you can give, all encouragement you can give to your colleagues in the business community to work with trade unions and to understand the value um, I would like to ask you for that um, and to thank you um, for the work that you already do with us in a very real way to come up with real solutions that can really work in real life. Um, then just the elephant in the room, and I say this because I know there's a lot of economists here and they'd be very angry if I don't mention it and they'd be right to be angry because it is the elephant in the room and the major hurdle is that uh, we, we adopted in the European Union a set of economic governance rules that will mean that member states will have to make choices in the coming period. And I very much hope that the choices that are made in the coming period are choices that lead to a, th a thriving enterprise, thriving workers, quality jobs, solutions, not ones made on cuts, cuts, not ones made on cuts to public services, because we need public services to have an environment for um, thriving business in the real economy not one based on cuts where the poorest have to pay, not one, not one where children go to, to school hungry because we've cut the benefits that their parents uh, are given. Those, those choices are not ones that the trade union will support, and I ask the business community not to support them either. Demand better. Join us. Join us in saying this is not the right approach. Join us in saying we need investment now, the investment we have now will provide in the future. We don't need cuts. Um, and, and so to ask you uh, to join us in that. We've been on the streets. We've been saying, no way, we won't pay. The trade union movement will do that. But by working with the community, with business community, we can do better if we jointly call for investments. Investments to make the green transition investments to make the digital transition and for that to be made in a way that guarantees the success not only of the enterprise but of the workers too. That's, uh, that's, that is how we will strengthen our European Union. So to conclude, um, I thank uh, everybody for being here this morning. I hope you enjoyed uh, your breakfast. I know that we're going to have an opportunity for questions. Um, so I give over to our moderator. Uh, and I'm not sure if I stay here for the questions. Yes. I stay here for the questions, so I'll, I'll stay and get the questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Lynch. As in previous events, the question and answer session will be moderated by Mr. Chris Burns, journalist. After the Q&A session, Ms. Lynch will have a few minutes for closing remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you, and I welcome your questions. Whoa, we got them already, fantastic. I mean, I, I've got one question for you, oh. uh, Esther, uh, and we know each other from yeah. past events and so forth. Um, you laid out this number of objectives that you have, the accomplishments that the Parliament and the EU have made uh, regarding um, employment. Uh, considering the new constellation after the European, latest European Parliament elections, how hopeful are you that you can accomplish these objectives uh, with the parliament, including with Irache, but 
how optimistic are you or pessimistic are you? And, and a, a bit of a rough start with the uh, Hungarian presidency, I believe, <laughs> right? Any comment on that? <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, so um, I'm, look, I'm always optimistic. Um, and the reason I'm always optimistic is because no matter what happens, the solution always is to unite working people, uh, to, to build that relationship between working people. Uh, we do it through trade unions. Um, we don't only look after trade union members. Collective bargaining boosts everybody's uh, position. There's a lot less inequality uh, in, in an economy when you have uh, higher levels of collective bargaining. So I'm confident that trade unions have the tools to resolve the problems. The challenge of doing that workplace by workplace by workplace is that we get more inequality and more uh, dangerous uh, competition rather than positive competition. So we would need to do it without the Parliament and the Commission. We would then need uh, the business community to come with us. But I'm also confident that we can get there. If you take the Antwerp Declaration, there's some stuff in the Antwerp Declaration we don't agree with. But Which you, you were there, I was by there. the way, when yeah, that yeah. was signed. It was calling for an industrial deal for to complement the Green Deal. Right? For quality jobs. An industrial deal for quality jobs. Yeah. So, 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 so business agrees with us. We need, we need an industrial policy, an industrial deal, in particular for energy intensive industries at this moment, but not just that. We need it for a digital transition. So, so, so I'm not convinced that there is as much disagreement on that as, being, as is being made out. And that's why I'm so disappointed that Ursula von der Leyen isn't already out saying that she's gonna have an industrial deal for quality jobs. And I'm so disappointed that she's not sitting down problem solving and setting out what the legislative initiatives are that she's going to have. There's no reason not to do it. We need to stop the grandstanding and all of that. We need, now's the time to get down, roll up our sleeves, get over ourselves and sit down and do it. Um, now in saying that, we're very clear the far right has nothing whatsoever to offer to working people in their communities. Um, they talk a good talk, but every single time we went and asked them to vote um, on any issue in the European Parliament, they, they voted against working people. So the only people that, that completely support what uh, Iraqsa has said, which is to keep uh, the far right out of that discussion. So I think that we have enough with the progressive, uh, we have, we have enough with the EPP, we have enough with the, with the Social Democrats, put on top of that the Green Group Renew, we have enough people there to do a deal, to do a good deal, and one that which will really d uh, deliver for working people. So I'm optimistic, I'm frustrated, okay. more, I'm, I'm not depressed, I'm not despondent, I'm more frustrated that things are not moving faster and clearer. Okay, um, if we can keep the answers a bit brief because we've got sorry. a lot of questions coming sorry, in and very little sorry, time. Yeah. Um, uh, from the, uh, the, the uh, UG, UGT uh, trade union, uh, the recently approved uh, I guess rerun of the EU's fiscal rules represents a dangerous return to austerity uh, policies that uh, had negative consequences as opposed to a fairer, more efficient form of governance. This is more of a statement. Do you, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, com I completely agree that there are member states uh, which have inflicted on themselves now a set of economic governance rules. Um, that will were, that were require choices, as I said, but more importantly, it reinforces the need for an EU-level investment instrument, and that's the discussion that we need to uh, force faster. But as I've said, at no, in, we don't agree that those uh, fiscal constraints should have been adopted without the, the instrument being in place, but most importantly, also without guarantees uh, to say that the member state can do everything it can to achieve the European pillar of social rights and all of the rights that are set out uh, in, in, in the pillar. Okay, well, a que question from uh, Efat. Uh, abusive subcontracting and unregulated labor intermediation uh, are structural is issues um, that are feeding an exploitative business model 
Um, how can we address these issues during the current EU term? What we need is a legislative initiative to limit the length of the supply chain, to guarantee that workers know who their employer is and to have joint and several liability because it's unacceptable that a company comes along, puts in a tender, wins the contract, and then says, well, it's news to me that the workers are not getting the a collective agreement. It's news to me that there's no health and safety. What can I do? That, we have to stop that. That's, that's, that's unfair competition. We need to stop that throughout Europe in, and, and in every sector. And of course, the building and construction sector that Christian represents is, uh, see Christian is here, the, um, that, that's, that, that, is, um, that, that, that is a sector where he can give lots of examples of that being the day-to-day -day reality. It's not, it's, it's not a rare occurrence, it's a regular occurrence. Okay. Can, I, can I back up to... Uh, uh, the, the UGT quest, the question is actually on the, on the Verso side here, that's why I missed it. Um, about austerity uh, policy, uh, could uh, this be addressed with a fairer tax system, mm. including taxing the richest, uh, special taxation on excessive profits? Yes. So um, the, the situation is, is, that the, is that working people pay the most amount of taxes in the European Union. It's, it's not by a small amount, it's by a long amount. Capital pays very little. We need to shift and have more taxes, in particular on windfall profits. We've seen uh, during, during the past period extraordinary profits in some companies and some sectors. They need to pay their fair share and they need the, a, a fairer system of taxation, in particular on wealth needs to be put in place. Okay, uh, from uh, Stefano Spinacci of the European Parliament, uh, democracy at work, how to advance on this subject, how uh, that can uh, reinforce our democracies, democracy at work? The European Union already has a good law on uh, worker participation at work. Um, the problem is, is that it's not, it's not being properly implemented everywhere, so it absolutely needs to be reinforced. But also it needs to be advanced, um, and there's a proposal for a directive, and uh, we're very much supporting and backing that. But also we need to reinforce collective bargaining and the right to collective bargaining. We need to make sure that uh, trade unions can be in the workplace, can meet with workers and discuss with them. That's one of the uh, big challenges that member states need to face up to and live up to now when they implement their national action plans for collective bargaining. Isn't that part, isn't that part of uh, the minimum wage directive, which has been approved and is to be transposed uh, by November? How hopeful are you that that could help democracy at work? The, That's my the, question. Yeah, so, so, so having a say is what's important in democracy. It's having uh, agency and involvement on the outcome. It's about having the facts so that you can make choices, but it's also about influencing the decisions that are made. Collective bargaining is the key way to do that. That's not just about pay, it's about the decisions on the company. Um, it's about whether AI will be implemented, whether or not it be implemented, how it will be implemented. All of that uh, is, done, is best done through uh, collective bargaining. But for collective bargaining to be genuine, it needs to be, workers need to have access to their trade union, their trade union needs to have access to them, and there needs to be sufficient coverage. Importantly, at sector level as well, because sector level is an important way to overcome competition on the basis of paying conditions uh, uh, within the sector. So that's why we very much support uh, the introduction of the action plans, but also legislation underpinning those action plans, also to guarantee sector level collective agreements. You mentioned uh, AI, here's a question. You mentioned AI as a key topic for the future of work. Uh, what are your concrete ideas of what needs to be done what, um, so that be it benefits working um, workers and the workplace? 
We need a guarantee for uh, the, the management of the introduction of AI in the workplace that unions can be involved in supporting workers at the level um, that it's being introduced. But also we need rights. We need guarantee of the precautionary principle. So you don't introduce something if, it, if there's a risk that it, that, it, that it won't be safe until you can put in place the measures to make it safe. We need to make sure that there's always a human making a decision, that you can always get to the human and make the decision. The worker needs to be in control of AI. It's not the other way around, that the AI will be in control of the human being at work. But also, and I know a lot of people here have to heard me talk about this, I'm concerned about the, the, how AI will interfere with the relationships that we all currently have at work. Thinking, for example, I know I don't have much time, but, but please let me make this point. Sure. Like, like, like when, you, when you check into a hotel, by the time you get up to your hotel room, you're going to be have on your phone, was that, had your nice, had your nice check-in? Was it a smiley face or an unhappy face check-in? You, you, you get that all the time. And I always say yes because you don't know what the previous person has said. You know, so, and it, it's hard enough for that worker checking you in without you having to feel nice about how they did it. The fact that you're checked in is good enough. The fact that they, that, they, that they provided you with the service is enough. Now, if you put into the hands of an unscrupulous employer artificial intelligence that can measure your emotion in every single second of that interaction, it means that interactions are never going to be real. They're going to be highly managed by the worker. So they're going to have to deep fake being happy all day, every day, if you're in a service profession. And that's not going to be acceptable. And we can stop that simply by saying no emotion management in the world of work. That's it. And then AI can be used for all of the benefits that it, that it can bring. Because it can bring a lot of benefits. It can do a lot of good things. But we need to have the moral imagination to prevent it doing the bad things. Don't put, don't put something good in the hands of, something, of somebody who wants to use it for bad purposes prevent the use, the bad use of AI. That's what we're saying. We're saying have, a, have an imagination about what might go wrong and prevent it before, before it happens. Okay, AI as a tool. Um, regarding the, this is from the DGB, uh, regarding the climate and digital transitions, we need to ensure that the transitions are adjust. Which instruments at the EU level are needed uh, the most uh, to ensure these results? There's, there's, two, there's two important tools. The first and most important is collective bargaining, and we've talked about how we make sure that people can join the trade union and to bargain. The second one then is, in, uh, is legislative tools. Legislative tools either to provide a framework of rights, a threshold of decency for everybody, but also legislative initiatives to provide for their investments. We need, we need a joined up approach between all of those. So collective bargaining supports, um, uh, supports real solutions at the level of the workplace, but backed up with a, a good set of rights and investments. Okay, um, let's see, let's move on to this sector of solar energy. Um, is solar energy a great partner for a European industry for getting better and more jobs. Yes. Can you comment on that sector? Yes, so the answer is yes, for sure. Okay. The challenge is the grid. It's not the solar, right. the real challenge is making sure that the grid can bring the solar energy uh, everywhere. So, so, and that needs investment, it needs a plan. It needs a European industrial policy plan to make sure that all of the great benefits that we will get from solar energy in Europe can, can, can get to the people who need to use that electricity. So the answer is absolutely an unreserved yes. The piece that's missing is the plan for the grid. Okay, um, this is from uh, Alex Adjou Sable, uh, uh, MEP. Uh, you mentioned uh, stress and burnouts as one of the biggest uh, challenges faced uh, by the working uh, class. Um, it, it, sorry. Um, is it important for the uh, commission to um, Sorry about that. 
to, uh, well, about the, the directive on the right to disconnect. Ah, yeah. That's a very uh, key yeah. issue. I think at the moment it's, uh, there is a consultation on that, right? Yeah, so not only that, we have one of the leaders in the European Parliament here with us uh, who's been advocating so strongly for the, for, for the right to disconnect, uh, but also for the right to telework and for the, for the modalities of that. That's right. Look, I mean, I'll be honest, everybody here knows like one of the biggest disappointments of my life uh, was, the, was the inability for us to be able to negotiate an agreement with the employers so that we could have an, a, a directive that we developed and put forward because then it would have worked in the world of work. The past, or to get over it, but as you can hear, I still have pain about it. Um, but now what we need to do is to have a, a, the directive legislated in the usual manner in the Parliament, um, a commission to come forward. The commission is currently um, bringing that forward. Uh, there's a negotiation where, um, so there's a consultation with the social partners. We're uh, inputting into that um, and uh, we hope uh, and expect to see within a very short period of time uh, that piece of legislation and it's so important and this is one of the strengths of the European Union is that we will know the baseline rules that apply to telework and the right to disconnect throughout Europe. You won't have to deal with a whole lot of different rules, it will be throughout Europe we'll have a, a baseline of rights and entitlements um, that will apply. Now importantly, this is what we were trying to do um, in, in this is what the trade union side was trying to do in the negotiation, was to provide for local negotiation on the modalities to make it more effective, to make it more, we say, uh, more appropriate for that particular enterprise, um, that particular sector. Um, I don't know whether that would be possible um, in, this, in, the, in this other way, but that but wasn't us, that, that we didn't turn our back on that approach. Um, so business community, you need to ask your side uh, why that happened. Um, but we're very much behind the directive, very much behind the persons uh, leading for that um, and calling for, for, for it to come into place for us because the world of work needs it. I think a related question from Sede. We do agree on many points, uh, such as the need to uh, review the public procurement directive, as you talked about, uh, and, uh, um, and the key role of investments. But member states are very divided. How to ensure a pro-European approach to accomplish that? So, so they shouldn't be so, so divided um, because it's already possible in the public procurement rules to decide something other than the cheapest price as the reason to give a tender. You can choose to say, well, we give the most economically advantageous or we can, go, we can also include in that social reasons to give a tender. So that's already possible. What we need to do now is move from it being possible to it being mandatory. We need to require the tender, the, the, the people deciding on the tender, to look at the quality of the work that's going to be provided. Is this tender on the basis of cutthroat terms and conditions? Or is this tender on the basis that it improves um, the lives of the workers? They've done it in America. They've done it very well in America. What they've done is they said, for example, if you have a construction um, tender, that you include in that a certain number of apprentices. Mm. That you include in that the collective agreement. It's, 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 it's basic stuff. It's making sure that the, that the, that the uh, public procurement contract is going to somebody who's a quality employer giving quality jobs. That's yep. it. I, I moderated an event recently at uh, Norway House. about There's an Oslo model, it's called, mm. where they do work public procurement in that fashion. And they say it's working. Yeah. And, and business is on board. So yeah. um, interesting. Um, here from the ETF. Uh, workers in many sectors are facing shocking levels of uh, uh, you know, stress, understaffing, um, health pro mental health problems. How uh, could or should a directive on psychosocial um, uh, work address these issues? Specifically, I know you mentioned yeah. it, but maybe you could be more specific. Yeah, there's two. So, so, so. Europe has a labour shortage of truck drivers. 
I can't remember the number, but it's a couple of hundred thousand of truck drivers is a labour shortage. Um, and it shouldn't be a surprise given the conditions that we expect truck drivers to work under. So truck drivers are, are not safe where they, where they stop. There's no toilet, there's no facilities. Nobody has taken an approach to providing that around Europe. So you can only imagine the stress of working under a situation where if you don't make the delivery at a certain day, at a certain time, in a certain way, your wage won't be paid. And to make that, what you have to do is to stop in places which aren't secure and where there are no facilities. So, so this, the Directive on Psychosocial Risks will allow us to look at all of those issues and to address them in a way that makes the work psychologically safe. It's also, it's also for, for um, uh, bus drivers. You meet bus drivers, the uh, life expectancy of bus drivers is actually low. That's, that's, that's the fact of the stress of driving a bus. It will cut your life short. That's, that's not me making that number up. That's science that's only that number. So, 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 so there are real problems in sectors and the having in place the directive on psychosocial risks gives us the tool to address those in a way that we have all the truck drivers that we need without having labour shortages of truck drivers or, where pe or asking people to do a job that's going to have a negative impact on their, on their health and their longevity. What about having the mothers that we need? Um, there's a question from Make Mothers Matter. Um, this is about work-life work balance. Uh, women, and in particular mothers, play a role of shock absorbers in crisis. How do we make sure that unpaid work, essential for societies, doesn't bring uh, poverty and other social injustices to mothers? They do, and science tells us that. I have no problem as a feminist saying that. No, no problem at all as a feminist saying that. Research has shown that having a common day off reduces stress. It used to be the case that the directive on working time in Europe said Sunday was the normal day off. And then we all decided, well, that's a bit wrong and we get rid of it. No problem whether it's Sunday, but there should be a common day off in Europe because families being able to get together does reduce stress. People being able to play sports on a day reduces stress. People knowing when, that, they, that they'll all be able to get together in a guaranteed way reduces stress. So, so, I, have, so, so I don't have a problem with those points. Where, where, where they become a problem is where we say the role of women in the family or the, or, or the role of women is to, is to have children or that that's the primary role of women. It's not. Every woman needs to choose for herself whether to have a family or not the type of family she wants, the person that she loves. Every woman needs to be able to do that. And that's what we stand up for in Europe. We stand in Europe so that every woman can make her own choice. Every man can make his own choice. Every person, no matter what their gender is, is welcome, respected, and there's a place for you. You choose how you live your own life in Europe. And that's what makes it a great place to live and work. It's, it's how we're strong. It's that, and we shouldn't undermine or go backwards on that. But I have every support um, I've, I'm a mother myself, and, and uh, so I know, I, know, I know how tough that is. I know the extra burden that you do in the day of work because you're also thinking about, you know, how do, my, how do I make sure everything is there for my family? But what I've witnessed, and this is the great thing, is what I've witnessed now, particularly in, the, in, in my own work, is young men taking that up. I think the role of men, I think that men have really stepped up um, in relation to, we say, helping with the family. I see people taking paternity leave. I'm very happy that that... I never thought when I started working we'd ever even have paternity leave. So I'm, I'm positive that we can create workplaces and a, work, and a rhythm of work which supports families and which supports people to be able to have and to choose whatever family and whatever type of family, whatever mix and blend uh, that they want to have. Everybody should be able uh, to... to, to to be who they are. Can I ask you about uh, a work in progress, excuse the pun, the Platform Work Directive has been approved by the Parliament. It got initial approval from the European Council, but we got to get final approval from the Council. 
Um, and after these latest elections, uh, we'll see what happens. But um, you, the ETUC has said it is a step forward, uh, but it, it's watered down. Uh, the, the presumption of employment could have been stronger and the chapter on algorithmic management could have prompted uh, 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 fully fledged uh, collective bargaining rights. Can you count on that a little bit more on that, the platform work directive, yeah. the, the gig so, economy? Right. So, so I have never witnessed the, the amount of lobbying in my life before that went in to try and prevent that directive coming uh, into place. And uh, it, 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 it it was extraordinary, and it was extraordinary because it was based on a value that said that not everybody's labor is worthy of protection. And that's why it was so important for us to win it, because everybody's labor is worthy of protection. But simply the fact that you have a bicycle doesn't make you a CEO. So, uh, so it was so important that we held accountable the employers and it was so Im important that we did it at this moment because during the COVID crisis, all of those delivery workers showed up and bought us medicine and food when we couldn't leave our houses. And we couldn't then, when we came out of COVID, after saying we're gonna build back better, leave the very people we relied on hanging and say to them, no, you, you can wait to some other time and we'll recognize and respect your labor some other time and in some other way. What we had to do was to make sure that the directive was very clear. Every worker is entitled to fair pay, to all of the protections, protections against sexual uh, harassment, protection against uh, uh, health and safety, uh, so that everybody's hour of labor is equally worthy uh, of protection. And that was what was so important about that. Now, as to the actual question, which is whether or not it was good enough, no. Has it solved all the problems? No, but that's why we're going to have to use all of the tools at our disposal. We have to get that legislation implemented, but we can't let that be the only thing that we do. We need to encourage those workers to join trade unions, to join with us, to join with the, with the, with the, with the rest of the movement, and to make each of the stands uh, for their rights in their sector, um, in the trade union, the, along with uh, everybody else. But that's why it was so important to make it very clear that workers, all workers, are equally uh, entitled to a quality job and to respect for, for the work that they do. How would you maybe answer, maybe uh, critics who might say, well, uh, if you attach too many rules to uh, the platform economy, you're going to be stifling a key part of the economy that is growing. How would you answer that? Yeah, so, so, so uh, this all comes down to what we mean by too many rules. So, so, so saying to an employer you're responsible uh, to make sure that, th th that the working hours of somebody um, are, we say, properly managed and that they get paid for that work and that they're safe when they go about doing it, is, that's not too many rules. That's a threshold of decency. So, so, so for us, and this is, and this is, is to say the real strength for workers of the European Union, is that we say there are certain, there's a, there's a certain level below which it's unacceptable in Europe that simply because you find somebody who, who, needs, who needs to do it out of, um, that, they're, that they're struggling so hard that they will put up with it, that doesn't make it okay. There's a threshold below which it's unacceptable for us to compete. We, keep, we compete above that. We compete on being better. We compete on being the best, on the most innovative, the most energetic, the most forward thinking, the best way of doing things. We do not compete in Europe on cutthroat terms and conditions and being the cheapest and the nastiest. That's not, that's not what Europe is about. That's not our strength. It will never be our strength. Shouldn't, we shouldn't aim for it to be our strength. We should drive high road competition. And we do that by having a threshold of decency everywhere in Europe. Now, before I uh, move to um, David Lungo, Managing Director of Indra's office in Brussels to make a comment, I, I have one final question to you. Is I know that you worked in a chip factory back in the ah, 80s. Yes. Uh, and Irache mentioned it uh, yeah. actually too. Yeah. 
Um, was there a light bulb moment when you were there that told you, I need to do what you're doing now? Oh, yeah, wow. Well, so, I think, I think I got caught by, so, so it was, a, it was a very, very long time ago, just to say that I was, uh, it was, I was, I was only almost 20 when I stood for election. In the, in, um, and, and the reason I stood for election was because workers would come to me and they say, I think this is wrong, I think that's wrong, and I think that we could do things better, and that's not fair, and in particular about overtime and who was selected for overtime. And so, um, uh, so, so what I witnessed was, rather than having individuals disagreeing about the overtime and it becoming like a, a divide and conquer between the workforce and, 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 and a thing that made it impossible to have a pint together at the, on, on a Friday or to have lunch together. Instead of that, by sticking together, we could come up with a fair system that would fairly share out the overtime in a way that the workers wanted it, and all we needed to do was to get management to agree to it. That was, that was, that was, that, that was what we were working on. And I noticed that because, because I was dealing with a reasonable employer, um, that they were very interested in the solutions that we were putting forward. And I noticed that the place ran better, we were more productive, everyone was happier. It was it's simply by bringing workers together, having that discussion and having a, a, a manager who was open. And then I saw that in the workplace, I saw that in the sector, I saw that at national level in Ireland, I was uh, involved in the negotiations, which were for a big deal um, for the pay increases for the country and, and, and everything else. And then, and then I came to Europe and said, what Europe needs is a lot more discussion and negotiation. Uh, and, and, and I'm just so encouraged by the great trade unions that there are, uh, are in Europe. And I regularly wake up and I just can't believe that I have this great job. This, this is the best job, really, like really. I know people say I've got the best job in the world. I really do. <laughs> so uh, so, so I, I love being the general secretary That's of the ETUC. Great. Yeah. So hope for social dialogue started way back there for you. But before we get a final comment from you, can we hear from David uh, uh, Luengo, who Managing Director, Indra's office in Brussels. Indra is uh, one of the sponsors of this event. I hope you're not too angry, Thank you. David. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Lynch. Uh, you have a quality job. <laughs> um, well, good morning, everybody. Good morning, guests, dear guests, Ambassador Embajador, Secretary General. Uh, all friends, um, dear Ms. Lynch, thank you very much. On behalf of the sponsors, Airbus, uh, AEG, Solaria, Telefonica, and Indra, I sincerely thank you for your very passionate and, and inspiring ideas. I am, I am working class as well. Eh? Uh, so, and, and my mother was for 30, 40 years uh, a nurse. Ah, so. <laughs> um, very, very inspiring ideas indeed in the name of, of labor. And, and I thank you and appreciate very much. Just, I, I, I mean, you've been um, uh, going deep into several ideas, many ideas to strengthen the union. Absolutely, I fully agree. I, go, I will not praise or criticize anything you said. Just let me focus on a couple of things you maybe didn't mention or I would like to stress. First, um, yes, popular dissatisfaction. You, you said about dissatisfaction, many things. I think this is, this is not new. Uh, maybe the new thing is the channels that we use to show dissatisfaction. And the digital social networks have something to do with that. Uh, and we need all, all our society, politicians, trade unions, companies, we need to, to drive this energy into something of value for society, Agreed. especially with the young, with the youth. Um, but yes, there, is, there are new realities. Huh? New realities, we need to adapt. And tech, technology, I'm coming from a technology company, Indra. Um, uh, tech is, is really changing the, 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 the our lives, mm. our society, the way we work, our economies. Software is radically changing all of this. You know about, about a little bit about that. Huh? Uh, mm -hmm. I saw in Twitter you were the other day talking about algorithm yeah. management in, in, in labor. 
this is happening. This is happening and very fast. So, and, and in the working environment, it, precisely this is very sensitive. Uh, I fully agree. Work is an extension of personality. It's, it has to be entrepreneurial in a certain way. It has to be, uh, I mean, to, to achieve something that is also good for the, for the others in, in the corporation or, mm. or in, the, in our community is self-fulfilling. So work is, is something that we need to take care of. And, and it has an individual dimension, but it's, it also has a corporate dimension. It also has a social dimension, of course. So yes, it is about quality jobs, but it is about performance and commitment to the corporation, to the enterprise. Mm. Uh, and the, the, for me, the enterprise, the goal, the goal of the enterprise is not profit. Profit is not the goal. Mm. Um, uh, profit is a condition. Uh, the goal of the enterprise is to serve the customers, to serve the community, to be responsible to the communities, to be responsible for the society. Mm. It's, it has to be good for society. Well, in this context, what is the role of an enterprise in the era of artificial intelligence, supercomputers, semiconductors, green fuels, electric planes? My colleagues of Airbus know a little bit about that. I think we can agree on two essential goals. One is competitiveness. In the current world, we need to compete. This is, this is not easy. Eh? This is going to be challenging. This is going to be very challenging for all of us, so we need to understand that in Europe, the internal market is not anymore a goal. The internal market is a platform to compete globally. It's a condition to compete. I'm sure that the Commission will prepare soon a competitiveness law. So we love uh, legislative acts in Brussels, you know. And second, it is about responsibility. It's about environmental responsibility, it's about social responsibility, it's about governance responsibility. This is paramount in my company in Indra. We, this is at the very highest level in our board of directors. Just for you to know. <laughs> so, um, all this uh, brings me to finally, a, a bit of uh, final reflection what is the role of the European Union today, at, the, at this very moment in time? Being aware about the tech transition, the tech revolution, the, the two transitions that you, you mentioned that we need, to, we, need, we need to take care of, the, 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 the consequences to the way we work, the way we live. I think we need to focus, and I, I, I feel that our members of parliament and colleagues in the council and should, should also make a reflection on that, we need to reflect on which are the EU common goods mm. that we need to take care of, that we need to invest in, that we need to focus on and we need to deliver together. Mm. And this together is something that matters a lot. David, I think we need to move on to a response so, from, yes. Okay. <laughs> Rather than focusing on legislative <laughs> tools, dear friend, maybe we should reflect on, proactively, on a new social paradigm. Yeah. And why not um, invest, innovate, compete, perform, excel to lead the future mm -hmm. together? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. <laughs> David Longo, Thank you, David. Thank you very much, David. And a final word I, from so, Esther, please. So I'm going to catch the ball that you bounced. Good. And I'm going to say the ETUC is available for that discussion. What we need is employers to come and discuss with us. So to, to, to take that, I believe that, that there are more employers that we can work with, um, that we can build exactly that idea, the common good, the common goods, and also a, a, a a world of work for quality jobs that we that, that, that we can make sure that the fr that regulatory environment supports that um, and that there's investment and that working together we can do that so I genuinely uh, catch that ball and I'm open to it and I know that Pepe will help us uh, have that uh, discussion uh, with you very good well to Esther to Idache to David and to you for your questions thank you very much please uh, And thanks to our sponsors as well. And uh, keep in mind, hashtag Forum Europa, hashtag Forum Europa for any pictures or ideas or comments uh, on this event. I'm Chris Burns. See you next time.
Thank you.